Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, January 9th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris on this episode. A bunch of news and notes. We'll have the latest on Carlos Correa. We've got a Phillies Tigers trade. We've got a player in San Francisco who passed the physical and had his contract formally announced. A bunch of other moves and happenings as well. Plus, we're going to get into some early 2023 draft talk. We're going to talk about some of the players up top that we have some concerns about and some of the questions that people have right now about roster construction during the upcoming season, some observations for those who've already done drafts up to this point. I think there's a, a lot that we could possibly learn from and some things that will probably help us shape the position previews. Uh, how's it going for you on this Monday, you know? Going good. I, uh, the 2023 in parenting is off to a great start. Uh, we misread the calendar. The uh, middle schools are off today here in Palo Alto, and uh, we thought it was elementary schools. So our kids got to school an hour late today. <laughs> it's a great start to the new year. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> do you, so. here's, the, here's the question. Do you think your children, you have smart kids, do you think your kids knew that they had school today and they were just playing it super chill? Like, no, no, we don't have They, they weren't saying anything. They weren't correcting you. Like They no, pulled, they pulled an all this grade prank on you. The, the my, one word my oldest the white is thinks a, tomorrow's Saturday. <laughs> and my oldest is a rule follower. He was actually extremely upset oh, that okay. we had forgotten. I can relate. Uh, also, I think they felt a little bit of the rug pulling under them, sort of. What? We thought we had one more day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It was all magic this weekend in the household. Um, the It's funny. Magic is listed as a game for 13 plus, and my 10-year-old loves it. And uh, my 8-year-old struggles to kind of stick with you for an entire game uh but uh also uh, wants to be part of what his older brother is doing so we discovered drafting uh this weekend which in um magic means you everybody comes to the table with three de- with three packs and you just open up the packs and uh pick one you pick one you pass the pack on along you know uh and uh at the end of it you play a game so it's kind of a fun, almost like, uh, I wonder if there's some way to bring that energy to fantasy baseball where, you know, there's a, like a draft, but the res- the resolution is quicker. Mm-hmm. Almost like a DFS fantasy hybrid where, you know, you get in there, you do a quick draft, and then you get, you get all those player stats for that day. And at the end of the day, you know, there's a winner or loser. Yeah, I tried to think of a way to have a baseball card connection to a daily game, and I haven't come up with anything that works yet. I did see this, that this could actually work. Well, this, yeah, this like right because we pick, yeah, we just, we just have if we just bring three baseball card packs to the table, you know, and you could do it, you could do it virtually too, I guess. But if you had three baseball cards to the table, you just pick, you pick one, and you're like, oh man, I got this player in there. Yeah, that's me, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that that actually is fun. That's you would need fun. an easy way to score it. If there was some way to scan the cards or just type a code in or something for each roster and then have a system that spits out your scores where you could track it, yeah. you got a product. Yeah. Why are we engineering this on the show? <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing we should be doing. We should be hey, doing hey, hey, co- copyright, copyright. Down. Copyright. Yeah, we, that, that's ours. That's our three. Copyright. <laughs> that'll that'll hold up the court. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll stop yes, him. judge and then i screamed copyright <laughs> it's legally binding for everyone who heard it anyone who's near someone who heard it and everyone on the planet at the time yeah clearly i didn't go to law school so <laughs> well uh yeah a lot going on and since we last spoke well carlos correa still in limbo <laughs> but the latest is that the twins are back in the mix which is I Wild. want this to go all the way around and the Giants sign him. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that in the days after the deal with the Giants fell apart, Adam Copeland had shared a, a KNBR tweet. I think it was one of the, the video people at KNBR put together this uh, this video. And it was like the play. It was the end, or something. Well, no, it was the end of the game play from Raiders Patriots where the Patriots on that lateral lost on the last play. They turned it over on like a crazy lateral play. The Raiders recovered it, 
and ran it back and won the game. And they replaced the football with Carlos Correa's head. <laughs> and they had Farhan. Farhan, I think, threw the lateral, threw the ball away. It was just, it was awesome. But they'll make a new version of that somehow, like some other sport. A little, a little bit of redemption in. for him, I think, and, you know, considering yeah. how everyone's trying to backpedal off of signing him. Yeah, I, I think he, he's got to be. Do you think, he, do you think he'll just sign something very similar to what he just signed with the Twins and just do it again? <sighs> no, because the, the, the problem is still the long-term health, right? Because then you're just, you're just delaying a resolution another offseason, and I think that works against him as a player because only, only bad things can happen to him at this point. He's proven who he is at his peak already, mm-hmm. right? So another peak season from Carlos Correa doesn't answer the question of, yeah, but what about the surgically repaired leg? It just makes him another year older. It just opens him up to the possibility of having a setback with that injury or having something else come up, right? So I think if you're him and you're Scott Boris, you're sitting there and you're saying, no, this is it. We have to get it done now. Maybe you can be more creative with the language. Maybe you could have more incentive-based clauses for playing time and different things that you want in there to get to the numbers you want. Maybe that's how they get there. But I don't think delaying it another year with a you know, pillow deal or a creative short-term yeah. deal with options, I don't think that's the best way out for him. Annoying, uh, uh, annoying, <laughs> annoying, annoying Boris, <laughs> annoying Boris. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> It's yeah. like there is a word there that's like a combination of knowing and being annoyed by. <laughs> but it's uh, knowing Boris, I think the the final number will have to be very similar. Um, I think that yeah, the devil will be in the details where it's like, oh yeah, we still got the three twenty, you know, but the last sixty million is all in like <laughs> like the incentives we just looked at in Miguel Cabrera's contract. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. He only gets the last three years of his deal if he averages 600 plate appearances <laughs> two years in a row right before. So uh, yeah, Miguel Cabrera's contract status uh, option of the day that is uh, pretty hilarious that we just discovered is that Miguel Cabrera, if he is in the top ten in voting in MVP this season in his age 40 career, we shouldn't laugh, man. Pujols just had that great year. What if Cabrera comes out and rakes? But in his in his age 40 season, if he's in the top 10 for MVP voting, uh, the two, a two-year $60 million option <laughs> gets vested. So uh, he has a lot of incentive to be good this year. <laughs> if that option vests, I'll eat a hat. Yeah, I, I agree, man. That's a I'm safe... Not, I'm not laughing. Yeah, Miguel. Miguel's had a great season. He's a Hall of Famer, but... Like, <laughs> yeah, he's an... I just... I love he's the easy idea Hall of Famer. throwing that one in the contract. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I'll be in the I'll be in the MVP. I will it, win the MVP at forty. What are you talking about? If I'm still that good, you will pay me at the end <laughs> of my career. Hey, give him credit for trying. Hey, he still gets eight million for walking away. So, that, see, that's smart. I we I I need to have more incentives in my life where I get something for walking away. <laughs> that's what I've learned from all of this. But speaking of the Tigers, they hooked up with the Phillies on a trade. Gregory Soto and Cody Clemens go to Philly. The Tigers get three players back. Matt Veerling, Nick Maton, and Donnie Sands. And really, Soto for Veerling is like the one-for-one part of the deal that we probably care the most about from a fantasy perspective because for the Phillies, we talked about Craig Kimbrell being added to that bullpen. You mentioned last week that you really like Sir Anthony Dominguez. Now they've got another good late-inning arm it does make taking shots in the Philly bullpen more difficult because even if they name a clear cut closer, they can name any one of those, those three options, their closer to begin the season. They have built in replacements. They have capable alternatives they could turn to very quickly if they don't like the way things are going in the late innings. Yes. And also I think this just a collection of high end lottery tickets to an extent. And we talked about this last time when we talked about this bullpen, but this is a bullpen full of players with great stuff and poor command. So uh, Soto fits right in. He's got a 104 stuff plus rating and a 93 uh, command last year in location plus uh, Kimbrel, uh, 111 in stuff plus actually had 102 location plus last year. Uh, I think he's therefore in, in the favorite for, for closing. I think that's, you know, 
it just sums up that he has the ability to, to do both a little better than maybe the other guys. Alvarado, uh, Jose Alvarado, 108 location, 90, uh, 108 stuff, 94 location. Um, and then who was the other one? Sir Anthony, my favorite. Uh, Sir Anthony, 121 stuff plus. That's my dude. Uh, unfortunately, 98 location plus. So that's why I like Sir Anthony Dominguez, but it also points to the fact that, you know, location plus is not as sticky year to year. Uh, and you've got guys with tremendous stuff up and down in this bullpen. Uh, it does make a, a betting. It's almost a little bit like that Mariners bullpen where you're like, yes, looking back, Paul Seawald was a great pick, right? And so looking back, maybe you could say Sir Anthony Dominguez will have been the right pick because you just had the best stuff out of all of them. Uh, that's what, what happened with Paul Seawald in, Mar in Seattle. But process-wise, we're trying to pick a winner. And I think in both of these Mariners and Phillies bullpens, it's like there's a lot of guys who could win. Like there could there, any one of these four guys could be a close, the, the primary close this year. Hmm. I think – yeah, I do. I do. I, I think that's the problem with the closer roles, that the number of yeah. players capable of handling it far exceeds the number of players that get to have the actual role. Mm. I think if I had to pick in Philly right now, if I'm investing in their bullpen, I'm actually, as long as the price on Craig Kimbrell stays reasonable, and maybe the addition of Soto keeps it somewhat in check, I think Kimbrell's the guy. I think Kimbrell is a likely Hall of Famer. Is that fair to say at this point? And I think there's something about managing a roster where a player like Kimbrell gets the benefit of the doubt when you're trying to assign roles like that. If they're not going to go committee, maybe they'll go committee. That's possible. But I think you you tend to see a guy like that get the first crack. So if I'm going to choose, I want the guy that's going to go first when the stuff is at least good, right? And if he does have the best location plus of the group, that gives him a slight edge. I'd be curious to know, you mentioned... You know, I think a 98 location plus for Gregory Soto. What is the median location plus for, like, I don't know, top 10 closers? The guys we trust. <laughs> the circle of trust closers. Like, what do you usually see for a location plus number? Uh, on throw me group? some of those guys. Diaz, Edwin Diaz, 100 location plus. Edwin Diaz, Josh Hader, people. Liam Hader. Hader Hader's going to have, a, has like the lowest uh, of anybody. 91. That's really bad. Liam Hendricks. Liam Hendricks, 98. Ryan Presley. Uh, 99. Jordan Romano. 98. So, yeah, 98, 99 is fine. Uh, you, you, you do make me uh, nervous when... So, Hayter had that bad year, right? Mm -hmm. And he was at 91. That's pretty bad. So, Soto at 93, that is worrisome. Location Plus has a, uh, doesn't have as much of a spread. So every, every point matters a little bit more. And so when you're around 98, 99, you're, you can, you're, you have decent command when you're at 93, like Soto. And that's why, you know, it's perfectly uh, fine. Some people do not like the deal uh, and do not think that they should have added Soto because for example, another strong metric is strikeouts minus walks. Um, and Soto has actually been below average for the last two years a, a, a consists peers by strikeouts minus walks. This is while putting up a 3-3 ERA uh, and having a great strikeout rate in 2021. He just does walk a ton of guys. And if you look at strikeouts minus walks, he's below average. But one of the reasons I think I like pulling stuff out is that you can see that he has some sort of stuff that is also reducing home runs. And I, I know you were looking in a small sample with a, with a reliever that, oh, in 123 innings of the last two years, he suppressed home runs. But is that real or not? Um, and I think stuff is, is the reason we have stuff plus is to be like, no, man, he throws like a 99 mile an hour sinker. Uh, yes, he does suppress uh, home runs. So uh, that could be important. You have Alvarado and Soto as these like, oh, another thing that makes it important is Alvarado and Soto are lefties at a time when uh, the shift rules are making, uh, making it more important that you strike out lefties. So with Soto and Alvarado, they can strike out two out of three lefties if there's a lineup situation in the seventh inning. They have a guy who can just strike those guys out. 
Yeah, I mean, all in all, Philly's bullpen is in a much better place today than it's been probably in three, four, five years. It's been a while since they've had this much quality to mix and match in those those late rolls. The big question, too, is that you look at the Tigers' bullpen. Soto was the guy last year. Joe Jimenez had that turnaround season. He's already been traded to Atlanta. Who is left in that bullpen that you like from a skills perspective that could emerge as the primary closer to replace Gregory Soto in Detroit? Yeah, we kind of looked through it before the show, and uh, I really think there's only one name. It's Alex Lang. Um, doesn't have great, great stuff. Uh, what did I what did I have for him overall? I think he's just basically above average, which for reliever is a 108. He's, you know, he's actually that's better than uh, the outgoing closer. But um, he doesn't do it uh, with a crazy fastball. It's a very good curveball that he's got. Um, and a decent changeup. So he's kind of a weird guy where he's like a, a bit of a, re- a starter reliever where he's got three, four pitches he actually throws, um, and none of them are like just an elite-level pitch. But uh, it's a little bit like because there's nothing else going on there. <laughs> he's the guy because nobody else is. Yeah. Yeah, the depth chart it doesn't look good right now. Maybe this is a team that takes a chance on a, a broken reliever that's coming off an injury, and and that that player emerges to close instead. So it's totally possible that they don't have the. Oh yeah, it's like it's like Trevor Rosenthal signed. Right. I don't know why that guy just can't. You're like broken. I'm like Trevor Rosenthal. <laughs> Sorry. Well, and they've got a lot of young pitchers coming off of injuries too. So depending on the timing of some of those guys, they may end up just moving a starter into that role at a certain point too. Right, because you, yeah, you Boyd, Lorenzen, Eduardo Rodriguez, Spencer Turnbull's coming back. You got Bo Brisky there for depth, and then you got Mize and Scoobal and Manning. So who you know was healthy at various points from that group could contribute in the rotation. And that's again. the idea. That's the idea for Detroit. Is like, you know, uh, we are trying to we aren't trying to do like a full long term rebuild. A reliever, especially when we have a bunch of starters that are in the midst of maybe not panning out. You know, those make great relievers. So, you know, if, if any of these guys, uh, if we pull the plug on any of these guys, they're going to be better as relievers. Um, and, you know, Michael Lorenzen, you know, uh, Matt Manning would be a closer, you know, a filthy closer. Yeah, he'd be filthy. Um, so, you know, there's there's uh, there's uh, as this team sort of progresses towards getting better, some of those stars will become relievers and they'll, they'll have relievers again. I think they're not they're not worried about this coming season as much as they are worried about, you know, year two or three. They This can't be a super long rebuild because they were in the middle of a rebuild. This is the rebuild. <laughs> so they can't just be like, we're starting completely over. I do think it must be a little bit hilarious uh, for the the president of baseball operations there um, who came from the Cubs uh, to come back to Javi Baez as his shortstop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wonder if there's any, if there's any, uh, uh, if there's any like, uh, if Scott Harris is like, oh man. <laughs> well, I, I think, told them in Chicago not to sign him. <laughs> I think he probably walked in and knew that was there already, of mm. course, because you know you look you look at the the roster before you take the job, and oh, okay, this is, this isn't how I would have done it, but at least I'm familiar with the player and know what he can do well and what he struggles with. Uh, but at yeah, d- defensively he'll stay at short uh, a few little years longer. So you know you've seen some other teams struggle to put a shortstop together at least they have a shortstop you know it, it does make everything else easier i think this veerling uh trade is is great for them because we do have you know sort of riley green austin meadows akil badu and miguel cabrera atop the depth chart at the positions where he's most likely to be uh you know playing that's pretty gettable mm-hmm. um you know, I think Miguel in his final season, uh, uh, top 10 MVP season, notwithstanding, is probably going to like uh, take lots of time off and 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 do a little a lot of waving and and accepting of gifts uh, this season, um, which leaves some DH opportunities available. And then Akil Badu, um, I think it, the jury is still out on if he is a major league starting player. 
Um, The projections have him as a league average bat with somewhere in between good corner uh, defense and bad center field defense, which is a tough place to be, man. I mean, Veerling can beat those things. Uh, Veerling, I think, could be a mediocre uh, center fielder defensively that goes 20-20 with a better OBP than than, uh, Badu. So I, I'm uh, I'm going to take some shots on Veerling this this year. I don't. It, it's a little bit of a deeper uh, situation, but and and they, and Veerling is not without his flaws. The reason they got him is because he hits the ball hard. The reason he hits the ball hard is he doesn't hit the ball in the air. These things are linked. That's why barrel rate is superior to the two hard hit rate or max EV or or average EV. That's why average EV actually doesn't have that much information in it. Um, if you look at what's predictive, average EV is not that predictive. It's not that useful. It's because if you hit the ball on the ground, it's easier to hit it hard. And uh, so his 5% bail rate is not amazing. He does hit the ball hard. They're just going to work with him on lifting the ball. But you don't think that everybody in Philadelphia was working with him on lifting the ball? Yeah. Yeah, I think they've they've tried to make those adjustments already because they yeah. can see it. And I think the... The tricky thing here is Veerling could end up just being mostly a small side platoon player. That's in the range mm-hmm. of outcomes as well. I do I mean, think that's, that's what that's what's being projected on us right now. But 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 if you look at his per plate appearance numbers, they'd be better than Badu's. Right. Badu when he when he came onto the scene in 2021, I think exceeded everyone's expectations because he'd barely played above low A. Ooh, he was playing at high five. A when he got hurt. Yeah. Rule five, lost pandemic season came up had an 8.8 percent barrel rate underneath the uh, you know good line 259 330 436 with power with speed that looked great yeah and then last year we saw the barrel rate get cut more than in half he was at 3.6 percent he was swinging more pitches outside the zone they were pretty quick to demote him at the beginning of the season too yeah they were just out on it and when he was in triple a he played great again he was yeah. great. He's only 23, so he wasn't old for the level. He was old, kind of an older 23 year old. But when you factor in all the missed time, I think it'd be silly to give up on Badu. I, I think yeah, that's true. You you want to play both of these guys, and I think yeah. unless they crowd up the DH mix somehow, they can both play. And Austin Meadows and Riley Green, they, all four of these guys can be in the lineup because they don't have to play Miguel Cabrera anymore. They just don't. So, it does bring down the sort of upside of everybody in a way if they are going to be committed to playing all four or five players. But if one guy gets hurt, then the other four can still play. So that's also in the cards. Yeah. I think Veerling is like a great, uh, and maybe Badu, uh, are, are decent. Um, you know, when you're doing a, a, a draft and hold or something um, and you're doing the backup phase. Mm hmm. You know, you've got your five starting outfielders. Now you want to start taking players. They are actually, I think, superior to a lot of uh, what people end up doing a lot in those leagues is is taking prospects. And I think somebody like Badu and Veerling is a better bet than taking a prospect because the prospect may just not play at all, you know? And there are going to be weeks in these leagues where you're like, ah, I just I need a guy who's going to play, and like the worst case scenario with uh, with Veerling and Badu is you plug them in, you get three games out of a week or four games out of a week. That's better than zero, and then you still have a little bit of that prospect like upside where like Veerling could go twenty twenty this year, Badu could go twenty ten this year, you know. So you take your pick out of the two. Uh, Badu being a lefty uh, helps him uh, a fair amount, and I am biased towards the things that Beerling does uh, in hitting the ball hard and, and making more contact than Badu. Uh, but I could see just picking Badu. I don't know. I, this is almost a 50, 50 for me. Uh, I'm going to take Beerling, but uh, you don't really want to spend the draft cost to take both. I think. No, you don't want both. We're, we're talking about deeper leagues. If this were a 15 team mixed league, we're talking one of the last few rounds. If you're thinking about either one of these guys, they're better suited for, Ale only leagues and uh, draft champions. It's the, it's not not a bad bench pick in a 15 team league because you will know in the first week if they're playing him. Yeah. You know, know pretty quickly it, if you want to cut them. Yeah. If it's like, if they're doing the thing where he gets, you know, two or three games in the first week, you can just, thanks. Not hanging on around for that. A few more news and notes. Michael Conforto's deal with the Giants is now official. After a, a year off due to injury, 
the expectation for Conforto, especially going to that park where it can be tough for lefties to hit for power? Yeah. It's funny. The Giants have shown the uh, the definite willingness, um, and, and it's because of the length of deals. You know, they're, they're, they'll go to one or one year in an option with anybody who's hurt. <laughs> I mean, I think they gave Trevor Rosenthal $5 million last year. Um, and obviously they've done it with uh, guys like, uh, I think Gossman was a little bit hurt the year. They signed him. And obviously, there was like a playing time, a playing quality ver- uh, a component to that. But then there's also, uh, you know, Rodon that they've done this with. So they're just uh, throwing their money around and getting the very best injury bounce back guys they can get. And I'm not a doctor and I have not seen Conforto's medical. So, like, I can't really tell you. Uh, he is now 29, though. And uh, I would have thought he was older. <laughs> you know when someone's gone you're just like oh he must be in his 30s nope no he's, he's not and I've, I've liked Conforto for a long time because we've seen some improvement with the swing and miss at times that it made me think that if it all came together what we saw in 2019 wasn't just the result of the ball he could run a little bit not be a liability in batting average but I think if I look at that slash line from steamer 243 340 411 that's probably where you should put expectations. I tend to believe he's going to go over on each of those numbers. Maybe the OBP is, is right, but I think the average and the slugging percentage could actually be higher if he's, in fact, completely healthy. And I tend to think he is, given the length of that layoff. I mean, that was a long, long time for him to go through rehab and, and recover. I mean, that's the, that's the nice thing. You're not going to, you're not buying the Conforto who just had surgery and is trying to play his way back into shape. Right, like there should have been enough time on where that that part is gone, uh, time away that, that that part is gone. So hopefully he's he's had like you you know players talk about having that full off season to prepare like normal. Uh, he should have had that, and I think the 168 of course is drawing into you know into the numbers. Uh, the 168 ISO that's projected for Conforto is drawing back on the 153 he had in 2021. But if you look beyond that he was consistently a 190 to 200 plus guy with ISO. And that's an important line because I think around 200 is where I think someone has real like actual power uh, under 200, uh, you know, is sort of more above average territory and that can go either way. So I, I yeah, I could see him hitting uh, 20, 22 homers this year, hitting 250, uh, being a, a, an asset in OBP leagues. Um, I think uh, I think also the the Giants really need. I know they do the mix and matching thing, and Conforto uh, is a lefty, and you know it's a possibility he gets platooned. But I actually think that they need some people that can start every day. If you look around this roster, I you know Conforto and Hanniger are the closest I get to being like, hey man, I'm just going to plug those guys in, and that's it for the whole team. Am I crazy? Mm-hmm. No, that's probably that's probably right, and I think that that's a big part of why they were in on Correa. They needed another guy they could just play every single day and not think you about it. You can't tune at every position. There's just not enough roster spots. No, yeah, you're just not going to get enough production mixing and matching at every spot either. Uh, you, you give up something quality wise. It works for a few spots. It doesn't work for every single spot on a roster. Uh, AJ Pollock is now in Seattle. Coming off a really bad year with the White Sox, I thought Pollock was really steady. I mean, I thought the, the power speed, the OBP, I, I know coming off of, of 2021, a 355 OBP that year was his highest since 2015. So I wasn't expecting that. But I also wasn't expecting a crash down to a 245, 292, 389 line. Projections are closer to that than the player he was when he left Los Angeles. How do you see him fitting into Seattle's outfield? Do you think he's more than more than like a semi-regular for them, given the, the outfield depth they've currently got? Yeah. I, I mean, it's being touted, I think, as a platoon with Jared Kelnick. I guess. I mean, because they're going to play, they're going to play Teoscar Hernandez probably as their DH, right? Yeah. Julio is the everyday center fielder. If you go Kelnick with Pollock in one spot, they still have one more outfield spot that's pretty flexible. Taylor Trammell, 
Cooper Hummel is a switch hitter, so maybe he's in the mix as a small side platoon partner. JP Morosi was on TV today saying uh, they should sign Brandon Belt. Wasn't that JP hmm. Morosi? Brandon Belt. Yeah, Brandon Belt to DH, mm-hmm. um, which would push Teoscar, I think, into the outfield. And, uh, you know, if it's not Belt, uh, the idea is interesting because DHs are the. Um, DHs are the easiest to get. So I guess Trey Mancini, uh, Luke Voigt, uh, depending on handedness issues, <laughs> Miguel Sano. Um, who else could be a DH? Uh, Nelson Cruz is still out there looking for a deal. That'd be kind of fun. They just don't strike me as a team that wants to add another DH to the mix, though. You don't think so? No, I, I think they need someone that can actually play the outfield. Okay, well, that leaves them with Jerks and Profar. David Peralta. That I could see. That yeah. actually makes a lot of sense. I think you've I solved think the puzzle if it's a signing. Of course, as we know with Seattle, it could always be something else. It could always be some kind of crazy trade that none of us uh, actually saw coming. Uh, Eric Hosmer lands with the Cubs. Does that give you any pause about Matt Mervis in redraft leagues just from an early season playing time perspective? It does. It's annoying. But Hosmer is only on a $750,000 deal. It's basically the veterans minimum. And I don't think that it necessarily signals any sort of long-term anything. I think it's... uh, Maybe Mervis will play his way on in the spring. Or maybe Mervis will have a bad spring and we have cover. Or maybe Mervis and Hosmer both play well and we have a DH and a first baseman out of it. You know? So um, I don't think it's anything other than them trying to get better on the margins uh, for cheap. And, uh, you know, for those that say that, you know, Hosmer hits the ball hard and on the uh, hits the ball hard and on the ground. Um, as a lefty, I would agree that he hits the ball on the ground. Um, I don't know how hard it is necessarily. Uh, you know, his we're talking about average EV here when I just told you not to use it, but it's not his hard hit rates. His his average EV were down last year. Uh, I would I would guess that he uh, benefits from the from the shift, but I. It is interesting. Who would you rather sign to a short term deal? Someone like Carlos Santana, lefty. G Man Choi, who's been shifted a lot, or Eric Hosmer, who makes a lot of contact but doesn't have that power upside. I think if think? I had if I had a roster that had a strikeout problem, I might have a, a lean toward Hosmer of all of those mm, players. He does make contact. That's true. But man, it's been it's been five years, and I realize 2020 wasn't a full season, but it's been five years since he has had a season where he's been a full win above replacement or better. It is brutal. Yeah, so it's pretty bad. I think Santana is probably the like in a just broader sense Santana's the guy for me yeah but I don't, I don't like any of them I don't want to rely on those players yeah well they all got the similar deals like sort mm-hmm. of you know not being paid that that well um, Hosmer as bad as he's been by wins by replacement has been above average with the bat three years in a row but it is so streaky oh my gosh what are his splits last year his first half let me see what if I have this better one here. First half. Uh, oh, that's interesting. His second half was better by WRC+. Plus. He hit 389 in March, right? So I was thinking, and that was his best, that was his best month. He's 389 in March with three homers. And then he didn't have another month where he hit more than two homers. Yeah, weird he player. He just stopped playing. That's what. That's why the second half splits don't work that well, because he stopped playing. He had two homers in the second half. He had eighty-three plate appearances in the second half. Well, the original question was a little bit of bait, though, because I do think they, they don't have enough talent on this roster where 
first base and DH are, are both blocked. You know, I, Mervis, if Mervis hits, Mervis plays. If there's That's a dip in where people yeah. are drafting him, I know he's a kind of a, a popular early sleeper. If he slides at all, I'm definitely still interested because they there's no reason why those two guys, Hosmer and Mervis, can't be in this lineup together with the way the roster is currently. Yeah, I mean, the other the other DH that's listed on their depth chart is Nelson Velasquez. He's you know, 24 and was 13 uh, percent worse than average with the bat last year. Yeah, uh, and is a righty. So I don't think that they are going to work hard to get Nelson Velasquez a bats and DH. I'm I'm right there with you. Some other non-fantasy news items to pass along. Trevor Bauer has been designated for assignment by the Dodgers. We'll wait and see if anything changes with his status. If a team actually does go out and sign him, I'm assuming he's going to clear waivers because no one's going to just pick up that contract. So we shall see and talk more about it if he ends up on a team. Major League Baseball lifted the ban on former Braves general manager John Coppolella. So it's kind of another wait and see for different reasons. Maybe it ends up another front to have those two items close to each other just because um, there's like a uh, a question of like redemption and like when has someone like when has someone when have we has someone served their time quote unquote and when they get allowed back in um, and with Coppolella, I think the one thing that we saw, we're not necessarily seeing with Bauer is contrition. Right. Um, and if you want to kind of parse the, <clears throat> the verbiage that's coming out from his camp and from MLB, when they reinstated him was, you know, he said he was sorry. He's, he hasn't, he hasn't done like a Pete Rose campaign where he's out there being like, you know, baseball screwed me. <laughs> I think he's just been out there being like, no, I, I made mistakes. And, I paid my time. I wouldn't be surprised to see him get some sort of consulting gig with someone quietly. Um, there were some things he did well, and uh, he may still he may still have value for a team. Yeah, for Bauer, it's uh, the question of like you know, if you're not going to be contrite, then how am I going to sell this? How am I going to sell to my fan base that I signed you if you're not going to say you're sorry at all? Yeah, I think that's a good summary of where things are at right now. Um, the other news that broke over the weekend, we found out late Sunday, Liam Hendricks has started treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So just all the best to Liam as he undergoes treatment. There's really not a lot known as far as when he might be able to come back and pitch again, but uh, all the best to him and hopefully a full recovery for Liam Hendricks as uh, he begins that treatment process. Is that what um, Mancini had? He had... No, Mancini, or I believe, was, was or colon, colon cancer. Colon cancer, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's rough. Uh, he's uh, an excellent closer, really uh, dedicated to um, you know certain nonprofits in his area, and uh, outspoken, uh, fun individual in the clubhouse. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Kendall Graveman uh, has pretty good stuff. He might step into that one. Um, I think that Bummer's command has been uh, tough in the past, and his stuff Bummer wasn't even that good. I think the white, the dark horse there is um, Lopez. Yeah, yeah, he's popped in the model for a while, and it seems like they've really committed to keeping him in some kind of shorter role, but uh, to be determined. Yeah, I think Ronaldo Lopez, and, and that's a that's sort of uh, a thing to sort of remember when we're talking about the Tigers situation, right? Is like the the long sort of winding career path that uh, Ronaldo Lopez has taken might end up as a pretty nasty closer at the end of his career, and that might be part of the who could they sign sort of answer for the Tigers. It might just be someone who was a starter for a long time that they see as more of a reliever now too. So I think we're at that stage in free agency where you have to kind of leave your mind open to some pretty different possibilities. That's a fun idea. Let me look real quick. Uh, Starting pitchers that you think could, they have to be young enough. Luke Weaver. That, yeah, he would be in that that cluster of guys that had a lot of chances as a starter, and it just doesn't seem like it's going to work out in that role. Chris Archer is like sort of halfway in between. Like he's already kind of like this three to four inning starter kind of guy. Yep. I think I think maybe trying to convince Chris Archer just give me one inning and 
I'll give you more money if you transition to reliever for me. Yeah. Air it out. Let's see what you can do. Yeah. Joe Ross is, you know, in a similar situation, but I, I don't know what his current medical status is. Those are some interesting guys. I think Joe Ross could be a pretty good closer. So if your team needs one, rebuilding or not, that might be the area of the free agent list to uh, focus your well, There's also on. Michael Fulmer still sitting out there. A reunion with the Tigers, huh? Okay. I don't know. They've got, like they've got like five million lying around, I'm sure. <laughs> I think you have to do something different at this point, though. I think you have to <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Forge your own path. We're, we're, we're doing something different. We're bringing back last year's closer. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get to a few broader fantasy topics. I was going to raise this after doing a, a 50 round drafted hold league about a week or so ago. It started up. I wanted to know, you know, do you have any first rounders, current top 15 ADP players that you are actually skeptical of as first rounders? Obviously, if someone's a first round pick, you're not looking at that player and saying, he's terrible. I don't want him on my team. It's just more like, I'm not going to take him in the first round. And he's probably not going to fall far enough for me to have a chance at that player. That's the the focus of the exercise. The the early, early players that you're going to sidestep in favor of someone else. So was there anyone that really kind of jumped off the page to you as you started looking at early ADP? I always cheat. Yeah, I always cheat. I, I, I'm not cheating like... Uh... By the by, the letter of the law, you said top fifteen by ADP, and Bo Bichette yep. is the fourteenth by ADP. However, I think that the way drafts actually work is that there are going to be uh, two or three people that take a pitcher in the first round, and as soon as there are uh, two or three people that take a pitcher in the first round, Bo Bichette is not a first rounder. <laughs> so right. that's I'm also cheating by like taking the the guy that's almost not a first round. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not i'm not shopping at, at one one telling you trey turner is not a first rounder <laughs> that would be a hot take uh but bobby um I, I feel like last year he was more of a uh that's what do we have at three i think it was like 20 23rd or something uh bat which means once you factor in the uh the starting pitchers he's more like 25 30 overall at least um and that i'm not sure that there's a lot more in him i know he had a weird shape to the season um and a lot of his value came late in the season i'm hoping uh, i'm not just sort of biased from how his season started uh, but he did do the thing again where he got caught eight times uh he, oh, actually before he was very highly efficient but in the minor leagues we spotted he uh he's been caught uh before when stealing and um so I looked at his, uh, his sprint speed uh, because I think that I'd like to know, uh, you know, I had a, I had done some research about where I think uh, the sprint speed guys are going to come from, where the new stolen base guys are going to come from, where the extra stolen bases are going to come from. And when I looked, I got, I thought like guys with sort of four, three times to first base might start taking off more because the math might change for them. Well, then I was surprised to find that Bo Bichette has a 4-5 to first base. And here are some interesting names that are faster than Bo Bichette. Uh, Chris Bryant is faster than Bo Bichette. Freddie Freeman is faster than Bo Bichette. And this is my favorite. Shea Langoliers is faster than Bo Bichette, or at least was last season to first base. If you look at the stolen base totals of the people that are around him, Freddie Freeman's 14 is a double, uh, double figures. Tony Kemp's 11 is double figures. Geraldo Perdomo's 10 is in double figures. And there's nobody else. You know, there's nobody else who is as fast as him in double figures. And those guys are weird enough as it is uh, to have as speed comps. Uh, Shea Langoliers had zero stolen bases, if you're wondering. Um, so uh, I don't think that Bo Bichette is right on the edge of gaining a bunch of stolen bases due to the new rules. I, do, I just, I don't think so. So I think he's a 25, 10 guy, maybe 25, 15. And I'm just not sure that's a first rounder. It's uh, it's not bad. It's like a second or third rounder. I'd love to have him. 
but first rounders generally are more superstar. You want to, you want a superstar. And I think this is more of a star. I know I'm, I'm sort of trying to shave the garlic here, but. No, well, hey, shaved garlic is uh, is necessary in some recipes, so <laughs> can't rule that out as a, a viable skill. But the the thing about Bo Bichette that I think is, is also pretty interesting is that he, with a very heavy opposite field approach, didn't lose nearly as much power as you might have expected between 2021 20, and 2022, right? 20, 29 homers in 2021, hit 24 homers last year. But that speed category, like 25 for 26 as a base dealer in 2021, I do fear that that might go down as kind of an outlier for him for his career. Now, maybe he benefits from the bigger bases and the rule changes and becomes a bit more efficient again this year. But if you go back and look at some of his minor league stolen base numbers, you don't see you don't see as much in the direction of the 25 for 26. You see more stuff that looks kind of like the 13 for 21 that we saw a year ago up and down the, the upper levels of that track record. So that is a reasonable concern. We're still talking about a guy that probably just goes eight to 10 picks earlier than he should. Should be mid to late second rounder. If, if he were going there, he'd probably be on a bunch of our teams because he gets pushed up. And part of that's the supporting cast. The Jays have a great lineup. So you're expecting a ton of runs and RBIs to kind of boost him up of over similar players that would go in this range. But as we saw last year, that can be a little bit flimsy. And I do think the other problem, problem, air quotes with Bo Bichette, is similar to the, the player I'm concerned about. It's a low OBP relative to other first rounders. Something about a guy that is getting a, a 333, 343 OBP, it's a tad on the low side. He's not a guy that walks a lot because he's able to hit bad balls, right? He puts a ton of balls mm-hmm. in play. And that, Good hit tool, yeah. that is kind of a funky thing to get past with the very first hitter that you're drafting in any given year. But the guy that I'm worried about is Bobby Witt Jr. Second year in a row where I don't like him at price, even though I like him as a player. There's absolutely there's no reason to look at Bobby Witt Jr. and say, I don't like that guy. I don't like his skills. It's just I don't like his skills relative to the other elite of the elite hitters. Doesn't have the speed concerns that you outline with Bo Bichette. It is funny that Shea Langoliers is faster. Than <laughs> just unexpected. He did steal some bases at AAA, though, so maybe we'll get a few bags from Langoliers this year in Oakland. 100th percentile sprint speed for Bobby Witt Jr. This is not a concern about speed. It's not a concern about raw power. It's looking at the projections. Seamer's got him at 262 and a 312 OBP after a 254, 294, 428 slash line in his rookie year. We know Kansas City is a difficult place to hit. We're always paying a premium for the guys that are young guys that could get better that have this power speed combo. I guess it's more of just like a broader. I don't want to pay for the guys who are still getting to that peak when I could get someone else, even if they don't run who I'm more certain of. Yes. Like I I think the other first rounders that go just after him, you look at Soto, Otani, Betts, Jordan Alvarez, even Vlad Jr. I feel better about them if I'm picking in the middle of round one than I feel about Bobby Witt Jr., even though I know the ceiling for Bobby Witt Jr. is that of a perennial first rounder. It just feels like the market is about a round early on him, and I'm going to miss out, at least in, in snake drafts. Yeah, could be could be the situation. I, I think uh, one thing that pops out to me when you mentioned the rest of the names that are right behind him that seem like better bets, the only one that steals any is Mookie Betts. I didn't mm-hmm. need to do that, but the better bet is Mookie Betts. Um, I, I I could see that. Mookie is, uh, I think, sort of underrated um, somehow. He, why does he always end up at the back end uh, of the first round when he's just keeps crunking out, you know, 30 homer seasons with stolen bases and great OBP and, you know, even last year wasn't one of his best seasons uh, and it was 35 homers and 12 stolen bases. Um, so I think I would rather have Mookie Betts than Bobby Wood Jr. Um, but stolen bases seem to be the reason that he has inflated to that part, that part of the, the draft schedule. Yeah, I think the the people who are concerned about Mookie Betts are probably looking at the speed and his age and saying, okay, we've reached this point where 10, 12 steals is probably the norm for him after mm. two seasons where he's had 22 combined stolen bases. Like that's that's fair. And then I think other people say, well, 35 home runs from Mookie last year. That doesn't seem repeatable either, even though he does make 
good contact. He doesn't make elite contact. He's got a 9.7% barrel rate. That's not usually what you see underneath a 35 home run bat. So you're kind of pulling down the power. You think the speed has a lower ceiling. Dodgers lineup is going to be as good as it was last year without Trey Turner. Probably not. So the counting stats might take a little bit of a hit too. So I loved Mookie last year. I had a lot of Mookie last year and a lot of Aaron Judge last year, and that was fantastic. I think I see a little more of the case against him now than I have in the past, but I'm... I'm not shying away from him and on my teams. If he's still there at the one, two turn and I can go Mookie in one of the pitchers, I could get Mookie Betts and Corbin Burns together to start a team. I'm really happy with that start where Mookie's going. I feel like in the past, he would have been a top five guy coming off the season. He just had. And now maybe the batting average is part of this too. two years in a row. He's in the two sixties. He's kind of staying where he should be relative to the other top end bats. Yeah. There's an interesting uh, thing forming here for me, which is that if I do have uh, two picks close to the turn, I may actually get a starting pitcher because there's a a weird grouping of players there around the turn. Uh, Just the beginning of the second round for a 15-team league, uh, at least by NFBC ADP, is Corbin Burns, Garrett Cole, Raphael Devers, Pete Alonzo, Fernando Tatis Jr., Edwin Diaz, Austin Riley. I'm not taking a closer in the second round. I don't, I'm not taking Fernando Tatis Jr. there. Um, I could see taking Pete Alonzo, I guess, but he's also not like a well rounded guy with steals. You know, I feel like if you just want me to get a 250 average, a lot of power, I can get that a little bit later too. So I'd be really, you know, is it Devers or is it Cole or Burns? That'll be a big decision uh, for me if I have a pick in that range. Yeah, th- there was something I noticed when I was setting the KDS when I was trying to set my preferred draft order for that draft champions league. And it was just based on what people have been doing. I like both ends more than I like being near the middle of the order based on what happens in rounds two and three. Because I share some of your concerns. I don't I don't want to draft Tatis that early with the time he's guaranteed to miss as he finishes up that that uh, recovery. And I look at the other I, I don't, same as you, I don't want Edwin Diaz that early. That's too much. Dude, Riley and Alondo are fine. Round, the second round is awful this year. It's not why it's is not, it so it's so weird. It's well, so it's because Trout missed a lot of time with injuries. I actually, I like Trout. If I'm if I'm forced, yeah, to like, Trout and Devers are in the second round, so I, that's not terrible. But th- those two and, are good. And, but like Real Muto's a little bit older. I mean, you could you could do that. I've done that before, where I get a, a premier catcher in a two catcher league. You're paying but, every possible tax yeah. on Real Muto right now. And then Sandy Alcantara really just had like a career type season. Mm-hmm. You know, to go for him there, I don't know. Austin Riley also. I love him, but there are parts of his approach that seem sometimes like they could be exploited. Like he could have a bad season, you know? He's not like the sort of perfect hitter. If you you look at do things like chase rate or walk rate or you know what I mean? Like you were talking about OBPs, like, you know, Riley is not necessarily uh a standout there he did have 349 367 but if you look at the first two years he struggled there 301 279 as he was coming up so do we just never look back at 19 and 20 for riley and say you know he never he's never going to be that guy again um i think there's some risk that he has a season that looks like that one year all of a sudden and i don't want to be holding the bag you know so and as a second round pick you're really just paying for exactly what he's done in the past with while ignoring the first two seasons when he was trying to get going. So I, I think Riley, that's really pushing it the, to the top of it. So I, like Alonzo Devers, I'm not saying I don't like those guys. They're in the second round, but Michael Harris, the second all the way up to the second round, you know, with a, with a poor chase rate and then hater class a and um, uh, Diaz are all in the second round. That's three picks. I'm not take. I'm not making. I know he looked really good again in the playoffs, but Josh Hader, where he's going, it, it's, it's amazing to me. It's like people have forgotten what was happening in the middle of the 2022 season from him. Yeah. But I, I know we talked about it when it was happening. The Edwin Diaz went through it a few years ago, and it can happen for closers, small sample. You start missing with your command. You give up some homers. It just 
it craters the ratios. I get that. But it's so hard to commit that pick to Hater when the alternatives are guys that can do everything. I mean, if you're looking at Lindor versus Hater and Marcus Simeon versus Hater, I like both Lindor and Simeon more at that turn. That's the end of round two, beginning of round three. If you're looking at even Aaron Nola versus Hater, I'd rather go with Nola and get the workhorse See starter. Strider, Woodruff. Right, Strider, Woodruff's going to creep up. I think the the observation you made about the pitching in general, I think that's almost certainly going to change. I think there's a, a lot of drafts Resident that were Cole happening. will move into the first round, round. Yeah, and there were a lot of drafts that were happening that were the Gladiator format. Maybe that had yeah. something to do with the format. I, I was about to say, the, the formats that are populating these ADPs are changing what we're looking at. Definitely, because in a draft and hold, you kind of like, I can almost see taking a closing second round because you the, you can win saves or at least stay competitive in saves if you just have one closer that you know is going to be a closer. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then you don't have to spend as many picks later on trying to get closers. So I can see taking Edwin Diaz, I guess, in the second. I don't think I'd take Hayter, uh, but I could see taking Edwin Diaz in the second in a draft and hold situation. And that's what most of these teams are right now. People aren't drafting the regular ones right now. I still, I still think in the regulars, you're going to see closers going as high as they've ever gone. I still think it's there, but I think you'll see the starting pitchers start to creep up a little bit. Uh, I did ask on Twitter. I was curious beyond outfield depth, which has been mentioned in this show before. I, you know, what issues are people most concerned about as they've gone through some early drafts? Uh, Doug on Twitter wrote, he's trying to get his head around how the rules changes impact this year's stat. Should I worry less about ground ball hitters, more about pitchers, how are steals going to play? It's an unknown, and you have to take a stand when drafting, and you could be completely wrong, which, yeah, that, that's like a broader like rules change concern that I don't know if that's necessarily being reflected in any player groups yet where people are are bumping up certain types of guys in a noticeable sort of way. I know on an individual level, people are saying uh, someone like Corey Seager should be moved up. And I, I trust him more with the new ship Tucker. Rules. Tucker, a lot of the guys that we've talked about uh, at various points, like those individual players maybe are moving a little, but I don't see like bigger changes for people trying to account for how the steals are going to play differently this year. Uh, Owen Poindexter pointed out, I do, I do think that lefty lefty sluggers lefty sluggers pulled sluggers you know I think that the batting averages are going to be they're going to be maybe the projections are going to be a little bit off right they might be low on certain types of players could offer a little bit of value you're talking like a round or two because people are already going to price them correctly based on power and run production in most cases mm-hmm. yeah and it is you have a choice there right it's like with batting average do I think that everyone's going to be off? And so then I don't, I don't chase batting average as much because, Oh, look, Kyle Schwarber hit 270 this year. You know, yeah. um, that might be a way to react. Another way to react is, well, everybody's batting average is going to be higher. So I should still make it a priority and try to stay above the, the rising tide, you know? Yeah. But I don't, I don't like to uh, chase batting average too hard. I'll just protect it early on. And then, when I'm taking shots late to get more power, uh, I'll be happy taking shots with guys who've hit 230 in the past if they're left-handed. Yeah, maybe you can be a little more aggressive with the batting average risk profiles you take a chance on when you're getting that cheap power later, but you still play the top end of the draft the same way as far as how you're accounting for the batting average foundations that you have. Because if everybody's getting a little more from the guys that were previously low average hitters, that it's the distribution's just going to move up. Like everybody yeah. in the standings table is going to have a better average. So you have to think, have a good plan. Think about the market too. Like, you know, if you're a really good player, like Aaron judge is a right-hander uh, who's not going to benefit. A, like he's not going to start stealing 50 bases a year because of the changes in rules. Right. So they didn't give him a ton of money because he's a right-hander. They gave him a ton of money. because He's really good. And mm-hmm. he, you know what I mean? So when you, as a, you're a team in the draft, like when you're spending money, a lot your biggest amount of money to just players that are good. You know, don't be like, don't be like, oh, I'm going to be sneaky here. And no, just what do you think are the best players? Those are probably going to be the best players. But later on, you can be, you know, with like the Pirates and sign Carlos Santana or whatever. You know, like you can do these little things where you're like, you're like, oh, you know, with these later picks, why don't I? Why don't I take a guy who's left-handed? Why don't I take a guy who's a four-three spin sprint speed and might steal more bases this year? You know? Yeah, I think the shift rules almost have more impact with the uh, the darts you're throwing in the middle and late rounds than they have on the actual like core strategy, the core players that you're going after. 
Because yeah, those, those that's why I get nervous down. about like people are talking about Kyle Tucker and Corey Seager. I'm, oh, there's, not, there's only so much inflation Kyle Tucker can have anyway. He's already a first rounder. Right. Um, but Corey Seager is going to get a lot of inflation because uh, people like the way these bad ball stats line up. But no matter what happens, he's not going to steal bases. You know, so like, you know, if there is a limit to where to the how much helium I will allow Corey Seager to have in my drafts. Yeah. Like, where's he going now? Out, uh, <laughs> for January, like 70. I mean, yeah. It's like, who's he, who's he going up against? Their guys are stealing bases in his, in his round. A whole bunch of pitchers in that range, but Tommy Edmond is your closest toss up. It's mm. basically your choices if you're looking for a middle infielder in that range. You're looking at, in many drafts, Corey Seager versus Tommy Edmond versus Trevor Story. And if you want to go to the outfield, you could go to Oscar Hernandez if you prefer power, Corbin Carroll and Starling Marte if you're looking for speed. And if you want to go catcher with Thump, Salvador Perez is in that range too. All right, I'm still happy taking him above those guys. Mostly, uh, I definitely want to. I think I want to take him over Edmund. Um, where uh, I might, so what I might try to do there is like uh, try go Corey Seager, Starling Marte, get my speed from the outfield that I would have gotten from the middle infield position. I wonder if part of what's going to tweak the early rounds too is the shapes of the positions. I know Owen, Owen Poindexter's written about that on the Athletic before. It's just one of my favorite draft kit pieces because it gives you an idea of how aggressively you might need to target something early if it drops off in a really sharp way, where there's a lot of platoons or just a, a weaker player pool because of old players or unproven young players. Uh, he wrote first base, second base, and third base all feel like spots where you get a top guy or hope you can snag someone in the bargain bin that you believe in, right? The middle players, the guys that go kind of in the pick 100 to 200 range are a little more uncertain at those positions. So knowing that, maybe you're pushing those guys up top to be part of your core group of hitters, depending on how you feel about the late Which options. Which positions did he say? He said first, second, and third, and a few other responses were saying there's a hard third base drop-off. They feel that that's one of the positions that uh, you really kind of want to prioritize early because there are a lot of flaws if you start to wait. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm looking right now at third base. I think uh, that's generally true outside the top 100 because Max Muncy, who has eligibility at multiple spots. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Look at this. This is funny. Arenado, Bregman, Gunnar Henderson, right? Yeah. You still you still feel like you're in the circle of trust, right? Yandy Diaz. <laughs> Yandy. Yandy Diaz comes after Gunnar Henderson. This is by Steamer Projections. Cabrian Hayes, who some people are oh, like, I am out. Projections, yeah. Jose yeah. Miranda. What? Ryan okay. McMahon. Okay. But Alec Bohm, who we just, we're just going to give him that after that season. Rendon Chapman with the, like the 230 batting average. Wow. Wow. I, I would like to make sure I get at least Bregman or Henderson. Yeah. And they're going at pick 87, 88. And then there's like a 50 to 60 pick cliff before you get to the Muncie, Miranda, because Suarez, Chapman really group. wants to do that. Right. So I think that's part of why, you know, you see, obviously, Jose Ramirez is a first rounder. We talked about Wit. He's third and shortstop eligible. So that's kind of nice in, in deeper leagues. Machado's up there. Playing more third than short this year. <laughs> yeah, based on your on how your lineup is built. But I think that's where Riley and Devers get that extra little lift. Too, mm, that's why baseball. Riley is a second rounder right now. Yeah, an early second rounder based on how things are going. I still can't rectify the difference between Arenado at 37 overall and Bregman at 87. That's just too big of a gap. But the problem with waiting on that gap is if you know more than half the room doesn't have a third baseman, all it takes mm. is one person saying, I'll take him at 60, I'll take him at 65. Like you you can yeah. play that game of chicken and get absolutely roasted. Like uh, yeah, like like you don't take Rondo Arnado because you think Bregman and Henderson are your stop gaps. Like your 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 what's it called? Your fail safes or like your your fallbacks. You know, last, yeah. Your fallbacks. And then Arnado, Bregman, and Henderson all going around. Mm -hmm. That's not impossible. Yeah. So I, I could just see uh, a lot of my builds having a circle of trust at third base, similar to past years at closer, where I'm really trying to get someone early on that I, I feel is good for 600 plate appearances and capable of 
being kind of a cornerstone in my lineup. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder how many gunners I'll have, uh, you know, there is, uh, there's the good and the bad with him. Really uh, nice chase rate, uh, pretty good walk and strikeout rates, uh, 10% barrel rate, 111 max EV. Like there's really nothing that I'm too worried about. The strikeout rate is a little bit higher than I expected, but uh, he's actually improved, like projected to improve it. The, the real question is just like how many steals will he have, I guess? Mm-hmm. Um, and if there will be any growing pains and like how much you want to trust a young, uh, a young guy like that. But I do think that sometimes there is an opportunity, especially when they're not uh, Bobby Witt um, to say, uh, I'm fine with Gunnar Henderson. Like I'm fine with paying 20 bucks for Gunnar Henderson, you know, because I, he's going to play, you know, and there's just a question of if he's good or great. I He's found, projected for thirteen dollars, by the way. So twenty yeah. would be aggressive, but I found last year I was hesitant to go after Wit in that range. It turns out I was wrong. Obviously, he's a first rounder now, and I'm mm-hmm. still skeptical because I'm a doofus. But um, I think that what are the outcome, the likely outcomes with Henderson, right? Like, what is the probability that Gunder Henderson is a first, second, even a third round pick going into next year's drafts versus the probability that he's an everyday guy that's just kind of good but not great versus the probability that he is bad and bad enough to even lose playing time or possibly get demoted. And I, I think trying to appropriately weight that, that is a really challenging proposition for me. And I think part of the reason I'd be initially afraid of Gunnar Henderson, at least based on where things stand today, is this depth problem we're talking about. Unless we think that there are a bunch of players who are going to come in to the third base pool. Like if our skepticism about the mid round third baseman is a sign that third base is going to have guys coming into the pool later. Okay. That's fine. Take some risk at third base. If it goes right, you're in great shape. If it doesn't, you're going to get your replacement. If you don't think those replacements are coming, then you don't want to take the risk at this particular position in that range. Mm. And that might, that might be your reason to not have Henderson think more than anything about Henderson himself. Right. You have to figure out like what problem can you fix in season and can you take a risk here versus at some other spot because either that category or that position is easy or difficult to get? I, I think I'm leaning uh, pro in a, a, a little bit here. There's um, just the Yandy Diaz having 641 plate appearance projected is where I'm looking. I just feel like that is a situation that I kind of doubt is going to shake out that way. Mm-hmm. And so there, you know, if, if it's Jonathan Aranda or, you know, any one of their interesting per Curtis Mead mm-hmm. in Tampa or a veteran or somebody that they didn't expect to play there. I, I, I see someone stepping forward there. Um, Haseon Kim getting 529 plate appearances uh, and, and Luis Urias getting 575 plate appearances. Um, I, those are places that I'm looking where there might be some opportunity for someone to establish themselves. Right. And it, it could be, you know, a player like Brett Beatty who looks blocked right now comes up. He has third base eligibility already. Maybe his playing time even comes in the playing outfit. somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he breaks through because the Mets need him and he ends up being one of their important young bats that comes through this year. Uh, maybe the reds for all the infielders they've traded for, maybe it's Spencer steer or, Kristen Encarnacion Strand, or, or people we're not even really thinking about in redraft leagues right now. Maybe players like that emerge on a few of Steer. these softer depth charts, and then those are great in-season pickups that end up kind of fixing some of this problem. Yeah, yeah, I could see. Yeah, there's ones that are not even listed. Here. It's like if you look, oh, that's not. There's not 30 teams listed here. So who who is this? Who is the third baseman for Cincinnati exactly? Right. How interesting are the players that are not projected favorably? on some of the unsettled depth charts. That, I think, is going to be an interesting thing to sort out and something that we'll dig into a bit once we get to our third base position preview for this season. There were a lot of other great responses that I'll sort of put into the positional previews because I think it, it'll it help us sort of frame uh, the bigger problems at hand. So if you got questions for a future episode, you can send those our way on Twitter. Eno's at Eno Saris. I'm at Derek Van Riper. You can email us, rates and barrels at theathletic.com. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you next week. Thanks for listening.